Welcome to First But Last, brought to you by the Wyoming Humanities. I am your host, Emmy DeGrappa. Wyoming is called the Equality State because we were the first to give women the right to vote. 150 years later, we wonder what Wyoming women think about their progress toward equality now. Let's find out, and thank you for listening. In this episode of First But Last, I want you to meet Sarah Burlingame. She represents Wyoming House District 44 in the Wyoming Legislature. She is also Executive Director of Wyoming Equality. Sarah is passionate about politics and community activism. Welcome, Sarah. Thanks for having me. Sarah, I love your name, Burlingame. Does it have particular meaning to it? It's a very different name. It is, yeah. So all Burlingames are related. There was only one shipment of us, and I'm I'm very proud to be a descendant of Anson Burlingame, who was in the legislature during the Civil War. As far as I know, he's the only other Burlingame <laughs> who's been elected uh, to public office. And he holds a special place for Chinese Americans because he was the first ever ambassador when China opened up its walls. Anson Burlingame became their ambassador. And when they established trade relations, they asked him to become their ambassador, like from China to the U.S. And Anson explained to them, that's treason. I can't serve another country. And because they had been walled off from like Western civilization for, you know, a couple hundred years, they said, well, you know our predicament. We don't really have anybody else, and we trust you implicitly. So he got a special dispensation from Abraham Lincoln's in, in Congress to, and he's the only American to have ever served another country. And they were right to do so because at the time they were trying to get Chinese immigrants codified as three fifths of a citizen, the same way they were they had already done to African Americans. And Anson Burlingame resisted that. He was an abolitionist. And um, yeah, I, I think um, when you elect Burlingames, you know, we do all right. That's an excellent story. And what a great piece of history for your family. I'm pretty proud of it. I like want to go to China and be like, hey, it's been a hundred years or so, but remember us? <laughs> Let's talk about coal. Years. Let's talk about coal. Yeah. <laughs> that would be a good strategy, actually. But tell me... Um, about some of your passion, especially your work in politics and how you became a community activist and and what was your road into politics? Sure. Yeah. I've been organizing since I was a kid. I grew up in the Intermountain West. I lived in a little military town in the Mojave Desert when I was in high school. It's a town called Ridgecrest and it's right on the cusp of Death Valley. It's a warm, inviting place. <laughs> it just happens to be next to Death Valley. Um, but it was a small military town, and um, I started organizing pro-choice demonstrations and talking about women's reproductive health as a teenager. And I did it because um, I was friends with a lot of women and was in a book club with some women who felt like they couldn't take that stance because they'd lose their jobs. It was a very small, very conservative town. And uh, even as as a teenager, I was very dialogue driven. Like I didn't want us to camp out on opposite sides and just kind of shout slogans at each other. Like I wanted to have a conversation. So that's where it started. That is excellent. (laughs) Yeah. And what was your journey to Wyoming? So my husband and I moved to Wyoming exactly 20 years ago. It's it's a terrible sort of um, benchmark, but we moved here in August of 1998 and um, Matthew Shepard's body was found in October. And so we just came up on the 20th anniversary of Matt's murder. And so I was like, oh, we've been here 20 years. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And and how long have you been working for Wyoming Equality? So I came to Wyoming Equality because uh, I'd been working for the Human Rights Campaign. And I had gotten um, hired there. Uh, my great friend and mentor, Sharon Groves, was the director of their faith and religion department. And they were looking for someone to deepen this conversation with members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And after the passage of Prop 8, it was really hard to find queer people who liked Mormons. (laughs) And uh, it's a very small niche that I fit. Because I had, as you and I have discussed, uh, I I blogged for uh, an LDS blog and had a real deep friendship and relationship with members of the LDS church. 
So I got hired by the Human Rights Campaign to uh, be a faith organizer. So I worked primarily with the Catholic Church here, the Church of Jesus Christ and Evangelicals. And that was my job until that funding ended. And then I was looking around for the next thing to do, and this job came open. Well, what I found interesting in what you were saying is that, one, you're not Mormon. Right. But you're writing for a Mormon blog. Yeah. I was the token Gentile. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) So that makes me curious how you had that close relationship with Mormons and their culture and their religion. Yeah. I... um subscribed to a magazine. It was called Bust Magazine, and it was a third wave feminist magazine. And they did a cover article on the the blog that I wrote for, Feminist Mormon Housewives. And it was so compelling to me, like, feminist Mormon housewives, what? You know, like, and like a lot of people, I think I thought, oh, that's really oxymoronic. Like, maybe I'll go on there and I'll tell them, like, ladies, you're doing it all wrong. (laughs) But I like to think that I was saved by having good manners because that was really my intention, you know, to go and tell them, like, folks, you cannot have this religious faith and be feminist. But it's rude to go into somebody's space and, like, tell them they're doing it wrong. So I started listening and reading the conversation, and I just thought, oh, man, these women are far more educated and knowledgeable than I am. Like, I have no business telling them what they can do. And I just really appreciated them. And now I just kind of say I was adopted into a tribe of Mormon feminists. And if you met these women, you would want to be adopted too. (laughs) And what does it mean to be a Mormon feminist? Because I I think that's really interesting. Yeah, I think for me it was about taking feminism out of a very dry, very academic context, right? About this abstraction of feminists, which it felt like—it doesn't feel that way now, but 10 years ago— It felt like we were maybe trapped there a little bit. And these were women who were really wrestling with their feminism inside of a very patriarchal structure. But they looked around them and they saw all these really strong women who were very accomplished. And they could see ways that they had also been encouraged in their faith tradition to be strong and accomplished and to really put themselves out there to be pioneers, if you will. And that sometimes these things were intention, you know, rubbed up against each other and caused friction. But other times they weren't. And they just wanted to have a deeper conversation about that with like-minded people. And um, I feel really lucky that they invited me in. And so they called themselves feminists and they still practice their Mormon religion. Yeah. And the church didn't reject that at all. Well, one of my good close friends, uh, Kate Kelly, she started a group called Ordain Women. And Ordain Women was asking the church, is now the time for women in the church to have the priesthood? And Kate was very publicly excommunicated. And that really um, cauterized sort of the hope and the growth and the momentum that people were feeling like, oh, in this moment— we're really starting to listen to each other. The church is really starting to get beyond this conversation around, you know, o- obedience and sort of top-down hierarchy. And that was deeply painful, really, really painful. So, no, I couldn't say across the board that uh, it, it was all just accepted. And like all movements, you know, when you had um, a group as open and ambitious as ordained women, the church kind of said, well, we're not going to negotiate with them. But everybody else who used to be what we considered, you know, the extreme edge has now become the middle. And we're happy to talk with you. That's really interesting. Right. That's how I um, had the contact information of a member of uh, the church PR and reached out to say, hey, I need your help because I'm meeting with these bishops and stake presidents here in Wyoming And I'm talking to them about suicide prevention. I'm talking to them about how to have a Fifth Sunday lesson, how to have a Relief Society or an Elders Quorum conversation using the church's own materials, not ours, but the church's materials to talk about the culture around LGBTQ members, not the doctrine, but the culture. And I had met with a bishop who had said, I'd love to let you do that, Sarah. I think it's a good idea. But I either need a letter from the First Presidency saying, Bishop, the door is open, you can do it, or I need a gay kid in my ward to kill himself. 
Wow. Yeah. Well, you know what? You made a jump there. So before you go further, I want you to explain to the audience what and who Wyoming Equality is and does sure. as an organization. Yeah. So this was, I was working with, for the human rights campaign at the time, but um, Wyoming Equality has a very faith organizing flavor to it because we're so small and I'm the director and I come from faith organizing. So we do a lot of it more so than some folks. The mission of Wyoming Equality, I'm just going to read it to you, is um, we strive to achieve equity for all lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, two-spirit, and queer Wyomingites by building broad and inclusive communities, shifting the hearts and minds of our neighbors, and achieving policy victories. Okay, so with that definition, what exactly do you do to make that happen? Yeah, so to be clear, there's myself, who's the executive director, and then we've got Ammon Medina, who is part-time, and he does both GSA coordinating, that's Gay Straight Alliances, and he also does fundraising for us. And then we have a very part-time office manager, and um, we usually try to get a, an intern from the social work program <laughs> at UW. So our little office tries to go around the state and be kind of proactive in meeting with folks in education, certainly, but community leaders, PFLAGs, parents, friends, and families of lesbian gays. We have a lot of PFLAG chapters around the state meeting with folks who, uh, municipalities who are looking to do non-discrimination ordinances or non-discrimination resolutions, sort of policy, things like that. But also a lot of churches. We talk to a lot of members of the faith community to say, hey, you know, we're not here to ask you to change your doctrine, but we're wondering if you have a member of your church, if they could hear a message of love and inclusiveness over the pulpit as an LGBTQ person. Okay, so in this message, and, and it just made me realize when I, when you're naming all these things, like there's GSA, mm-hmm. there's um, P flag, P flag. Why aren't they just one? Why? What makes them different? Oh, um, gay straight alliances are in schools, so junior high, high school. They're clubs. They're clubs. Um, okay. Yeah. So like FFA, right? Future Farmers of America. Okay. Like it's a club around a specific purpose, but they're for students. And so P flag, typically P flag are just like parent, friends, and family. So these are allies who are kind of coordinating as allies. That's not true everywhere. I mean, Casper's P flag is mostly LGBTQ folks. It's not mostly allies. So then how does that come into it? The LGBTQ folks? How do how do you are you the bigger support over both of those? Right. So we're statewide. Yeah. So we have some like grants and funding opportunities where we try to um, get money to folks who need it for travel or um, events or something, but also programming. So we'll come and we'll do trainings. We'll come and we'll um, host community conversations to just see, you know, like what's happening in the community. Where do people feel like they need more support? And we're kind of shifting. We used to do far more social events. And now we do more sort of policy events. But just like a conversation we had up in Gillette recently when they I came up to speak um, to the Gillette P flag. And we just had a conversation about how doing this kind of movement work and organizing in places where there's a lot of hostility towards it requires us all to take good care of each other. <laughs> And to, like, understand that, like, it's hard work in Wyoming. You need support. You particularly need support if you're worried that, like, advocating for your gay son or standing up for yourself as, you know, a lesbian worker could get you fired, could get you evicted, could get you, you know, refuse service. And you don't have any legal protections most places for that um, unless your particular place of business chooses it. And that that can be really hard. And one of the ways... As, as a movement that we can kind of push back against that is to remember to take really good care of each other. So potlucks are a great way to move LGBTQ advocacy forward. Like that is a legitimate way to create a robust LGBTQ community. Potlucks, taking each other out for tea. That's the sort of conversations that we have about building community. It's not just all policy. Well, maybe there should be a, a GSA for not students, but more 
just community members to understand. That's P flag, and yeah, that is. That we is. would okay. love. To, so uh, the communities around the state who have really fantastic P flags. Um, we have one starting here in Cheyenne. Uh, Laramie has a P flag that just started this last year, and we can put links up to all this. Yeah, yeah. Um, Casper has a great P flag that's been going for a long time, as does Jackson and Gillette. Okay. Those are the only ones I'm aware of, but um, they're fantastic resources and they provide a lot of like care and support for the community. Right. Okay. Let's go into the topic of equality. So it's not your organization equality, but it's Wyoming as the equality state. Yeah. And how do you feel about women and equality in the equality state? <laughs> I feel conflicted. There's a couple little easy tests that I like to do, a, a little rubric. One thing I like to say is when we talk about women's rights, when we talk about suffrage and women's equality, could we, and have it still make sense, say white women's equality? <laughs> and would it be more accurate to name it as white women's equality? Or do we actually mean women? When we say women got the right to vote, what we actually mean is white women got the right to vote, right? Correct. Because non-white women, even though in law it just said women, we know that it was understood to be white women. And we know that because there was um, what's called a, a poison amendment, meant to kill the bill, the same day it passed. And it was a legislator also out of South Pass who said that um, you know suffrage would apply to the colored woman and the squaw. Sorry for the... And that amendment failed. And there was never any intention for suffrage to be inclusive of races outside of the white race. And some of the ways in which suffrage was that, that we attempted to pass it was by calling on explicitly racist language, right? By saying, like, after the passage of the 14th Amendment, we needed to give white women the right to vote in order to codify white supremacy. So I feel very conflicted, right? Because on the one hand, I want to absolutely celebrate that Wyoming passed suffrage. But I also want to complicate that history with the reality that we did not give all women the right to vote. And the resolution that we passed that Senator Ellis um, sponsored and spearheaded that had uh, every female member of the House and Senate as, as co-sponsors on, I thought did a really fantastic job of changing the conversation about suffrage. Whereas in the past, we have said women were granted the right to vote. Women received the right to vote. And what the resolution kind of restates for people is that the inalienable right to vote was recognized by Wyoming. And that's an important distinction. Well, and that's something to commemorate, actually. That language right there is that you just said it. Well, right. And Representative uh, Andy Clifford put a really important amendment into that resolution because it called attention to the fact that there was racism in how it was carried out and how it was conceptualized, right? It, it was a great amendment to it to be a placeholder so that people don't kind of whitewash our history. Well, that's a whole nother complicated subject, sir. <laughs> it is a really complicated subject, but I think it's one that, you know, we should all be having. Another thing we do at Wyoming Equality that uh, I think is kind of great, a um, uh, board member, Shana Lona Aya Alexander, and I came up with this. We call it the um, the jackalope test. Have you heard of the, the Bechdel test? No. So the Bechdel test is if you're watching a movie... It has to pass two characteristics. Are there more than one woman? And do they talk to each other about something other than a man? And oh like 90% of all movies fail the Bechdel test. And you don't realize it, right? Until you look for it. Oh my gosh. No. Okay. Now yeah. I'm going to really look for it. So in the Jackalope test, we just say in any given meeting or board or organization, could it innocently be mistaken for a white supremacy gathering. Wow. Is it 100% white? Is anyone else represented there? That's what we call the jackalope test. Oh my gosh, that's and really interesting. 
for our own organization, right? Like sometimes we'll look at like, hey, we're going to put together this committee to talk about this certain thing. And we look at it and we go, huh, this could innocently be mistaken for a, uh, a white supremacy meeting because it is only white people. Or if we're having a conversation or frequently like we're called on to say, hey, we want someone to come and talk to us about like healthcare and transgender people. But they'll ask us, like me, a cisgender person, and we'll say like, well, I- I'm not the best person to ask about that. Like I'm going to find a couple of people from our boards or our committees who are transgender and who have first, you know, hand experience with that. And we're going to ask them to speak to it. So that's another thing that whammy equality does is just try to change that sort of polity. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, and I think you made some good points there. And I think that diversity and inclusion in any group in Wyoming has to be very intentional. And I think people just call the people they know and, you know, let's all get together and have this meeting when actually they're not being intentional about making sure that many voices are represented of diverse, you know, backgrounds and That's right. cultures. and Or we swing to the other side, which is just tokenism, right? Right. Like, oh, we need to have a gay person. We need to have a black person. Right. And so we're really trying to change that and deepen that conversation around, oh, no, it's not that you need to check a box. It's not that you need, like, a token anybody. Rather... We want to represent the people we serve. We want the people to look and say, oh, hey, in these decision-making seats of power, there's somebody who looks like me. There's somebody who's shared an experience like mine. And that's really valuable. So my last question is, Sarah, if you could wave your magic wand, Mm. what would you like to see happen in Wyoming for the future of gays and lesbians? And just diversity in general. Well, I'm glad you like narrowed it down because I was like, oh, man, my magic wand, like (laughs) my magic wand wants a lot of things. I think it's pretty simple. I just want hearts opened. Like part of our advocacy and part of my personal advocacy is that at the end of the day, we can absolutely disagree and we can absolutely love each other and we can have respect for each other. There's this great James Baldwin quote where he says, unless our disagreement is rooted in my oppression and dehumanization, <laughs> you know, that there, there is a boundary there. But if I had a magic wand, it would absolutely be that um, LGBTQ Wyomingites were really considered as full humans, as full citizens, and that people kept an open heart and thought, um, if this were me, If this were somebody that I loved, you know, how would I want them treated? How would I want their rights protected? How would I want them to feel welcomed in to this community, you know, that we call Wyoming? Right. Which is a community, even though it's a huge state, but our population is so small. We're we're really a community. We are. (laughs) That's true. That's the community that we love. Absolutely. Thank you for being here. Thanks so much for coming. And and I'm glad you got to see downtown Cheyenne. Yay. (laughs) Thank you for listening to First But Last, brought to you by the Wyoming Humanities. Please join us again next week as we continue our conversations with women from around the state. You can also find us at thinkwhy.org, where we continue the conversation on our blog about the history, journey, and the challenges of Wyoming's intrepid women living in the equality state. And if you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe to the show and leave us a review on iTunes. Thank you for listening.